So this is the first Clinicians on Fire event in the UK. Woo! Okay. Come on, a little bit more participation. Yes, come on. Yes. No pressure, David. <laughs> Interopen is now almost two years old, so it, it is a real toddler. And, and it was set up to um, promote the creation and use of national open standards for information sharing and interoperability initially using FIRE and we need to remember that it was initially a vendor-led organization but now has broadened to become uh, a group, a community of many individual organizations who have a stake in information sharing. And currently we're working through to identify is there a methodology by which we can all work together to take a use case concept and deliver it into the service? Uh, and there's a bit of like tugging and throwing, a bit of tension there because organizations have their own identities and sometimes you have to give up a little bit to get a bit more back for the greater system. So we're working through this together and, you, and you'll see the, um, the board members of those stakeholder organizations. Ambulance encounter and, and the transfer of those details to apps to A&E or to the GP is seen as a possible use case study that we might want to push through the community to find out how we might take a concept into delivery and it's not on any of the national priorities in terms of any plans at the moment so it might be a very good one to push through the interopen space. So today interopen now has 162 member organizations uh, and it has been growing very much organically. It has also been commissioned to do events at Expo and EHI Live on interoperability. And I'm pleased to say, say that the, the way that we tend to operate is that we ask our members to um, give up their suggestions of case stories and the members vote on it. It's a very open process. And increasingly, I think we had six for uh, Expo um, case studies and uh, at uh, EHI Live, I think we had 10, and increasing numbers of members are voting. And we have an online platform called Riva that you can access and contribute and share information. Interoperability education, however, is a very important part of Int uh, Interopen's activity as well. So we are delighted to be able to offer our second free event, Clinicians on our Fire, so you will get your £25 reimbursed by attending. Those who haven't attended will have to figure out what we do with that £25. <laughs> but well done for attending and thank you very much. Uh, and we need to remember that because Interopen is not, doesn't have any f sort of money at the moment as, uh, attached to it, it isn't a legal entity but we're hoping to get to there, it's actually a community funded by the goodwill and resource and effort of its members through direct offering of expert people or some sponsorship. So today really would not at all have been possible without the generous sponsorship of Orion Health who have funded the location, the food, the refreshments. Was that an unending bar? <laughs> <laughs> I used to work for Orion Health. <laughs> who, where's my previous boss? <laughs> um, so, and also the dedicated time of David Hay, who is, who is an internationally recognized fire expert. And we also need to thank Helen Young, Interopens comms team expert, who has helped, you know, a lot of you have been in contact with her and you'll notice it, and Helen has replied very quickly to all your queries. So thank you very, very much to Helen for all her help. In addition, David has worked uh, on uh, over the set, sort of last several months with me, often at 12 hour difference time zones on Skype. He's got to know all the different onesies I wear. I think my favorite is my Spider-Man at the moment. So we've got to know each other quite well. I've got some screen <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and he has also done two of these types of workshops, um, one in New Zealand, and um, where was the other one? Amsterdam. So we've learned about how to do these things and tweak them as we go along. So today is really about learning together in a relaxed environment about fire with some hands-on exercises using some tooling that David's developed. It's called Climfire. We'll introduce you to that. We are going to be primarily focused on giving clinicians a greater understanding of where they can add value to the important aspect of designing interoperable clinical messages. 
but an also an overview of the technical aspects of fire so that they have a greater appreciation of the role of those fire technical experts and the terminologists in designing the whole end-to-end -end process. We have deliberately, however, been open to everybody attending from experts who have, clinicians who have lower level of knowledge to higher level of knowledge, technical experts, CIOs and program managers because we, we, we very firmly believe that understanding interoperability requires everybody to have a common language and that's still building on the principle of the Interop Summit which was everyone having a common language of interoperability and you'll be able to find those videos for that at interopsummit.com. So please could you give a warm welcome to Dr. David Hay, who will be leading today's first Clinicians on Fire Sir, uh, workshop in the UK. David, thank you very much. Just move my bag out of the way. Um, okay, can everybody hear me all right? Excellent. Well, um, as Amir said, I'm, um, I'm very glad to be here. Thanks for coming along. I appreciate that uh, Many of you are, are very busy, so I do appreciate the time that you've taken. Um, just a little bit about myself. I, I am a medical doctor, uh, or I was. I actually stopped practice about, um, about 20 years ago now, which perhaps ages me just a little wee bit. Um, I've uh, worked with HL7 New Zealand. I've been the chair. I'm now the chair emeritus of HL7 New Zealand. I'm a co-chair of the fire management group. Uh, I've been involved in fire pretty much since its inception. Um, I'm not... I, I, I'm, I guess I'm one of the developers, one of many of the developers. Uh, I, I, have, I always find it odd when someone calls me an expert. I don't really regard myself as an expert. I just happen to know a little bit more than, than others, but I hope to pass some of that on. My day job is as a product strategist, which is a wonderful title, because it can mean almost anything, um, for Orion Health. Uh, and as the Mayor has said, they um, have sponsored this event and uh, are allowing me to come out here and, uh, and share with you guys. I blog on um, on fire at that address, and as Amira said, I'm responsible for the uh, for the tooling that we're going to be talking about um, today. Um, quick show of hands: Who here would regard themselves as a clinical in the most? Oh, that's wonderful! It's terrific. Can I just take a picture of that? That was brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> you have to hold your hands up a little bit longer. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're yeah. not in the photo, forgive yeah. me. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you. And second question. Who knows a fair amount already about fire? Uh, I was going to call you out if you hadn't put your hand up there, Richard, but okay, that's fine. Um, uh, that, that's okay. I'm, I'm not going to call you out or do anything like that, just to get a feel for, um, uh, for, for what we're uh, going to do today. So this is the sort of plan for the day. So I'm going to talk about the purpose of, of the workshop, or the purpose of the workshop as, as I perceive it to be. Then we're going to talk about the clinical problem. Uh, this is actually, as Amir has said, this is a workshop that we're kind of working on uh, in some ways together. And so it was Amir's idea to, to start with a clinical problem, which I thought was an excellent one. Then once we've got that, we'll create uh, what we call an information model. And I'll explain all this stuff as we go through. Um, then we're going to go sideways a little bit into fire itself. We'll talk about what fire is, some of the basics of it, really enough for a clinician to do. Uh, to understand. Then we'll go into a resources model, we'll create some instance graphs. Again, these are all exercises which, uh, which you guys will do. Uh, incidentally, the slides will be made available after this event, uh, of course. Um, we're going to talk about structured and coded data, we'll talk about documents, profilings, <laughs> and moving from uh, models to artifacts and some last thoughts. So that's, that's overall what I would like to achieve for the day. I hope I'm not going to spend the whole day talking you really don't want to listen to me for a whole day. So that's a kind of, kind of um, segue into saying, if you've got any questions as we go, sing out. You know, I'm happy to take questions uh, of any sort. If, uh, you know, if they're relatively simple, we'll answer them straight away. If not, then um, we'll, we can take it offline. But please, don't, don't hesitate about asking questions if I say something that you're not uh, sure on. And so this is kind of the objectives. <laughs> What's What's fundamental to all of this, what's driving me in all of this, is that I think that FIRE presents an opportunity for the clinical folk, and you're going to get sick of me saying this, but for the clinical folk, and I mean that in a very, very broad sense, from sort of professional clinical, doctors, nurses, social, those who are uh, pretty much anybody who is involved in delivering care at any kind of capacity, to become more involved in health informatics. 
I think it's been a bit of a black art in some ways up until now. You know, the, the clinician will sort of say, well, here's what I want to do, and they'll give it to a, a BA who does some stuff, and they give it to a technical person who does some more stuff. And the further on you go down the chain, the less and less you understand about what's actually happening. And I really think that FIRE has got the ability to allow the clinicians to become more involved throughout the life cycle of a project. And pretty much what today is all about is to sort of share that kind of vision, if you like, that kind of thinking, and see what you think. Um, I want to introduce you to FIRE itself. Oh, sorry. And so what I'm kind of thinking is that it would be cool if a, an event such as this could be sort of made repeatable. So that if you were going to a place and clinical folk were, were being start to be involved in a project of some sort but knew nothing about it, there was like a, a sort of a pre-canned program that you could roll out that somebody who understood the clinical domain and who understood fire could sort of give. Um, so developing that is, uh, is really part of what I would like to achieve. I obviously want to introduce you to fire, uh, and again it's going to be at a fairly superficial level. Fire has become quite large uh, and encompassing but I want to try and give you a feel for what the main parts of it are. Obviously we want to talk about the ClinFire tooling itself, which is part of the way that I think clinical folk can get involved uh, and how to use it. And I'm going to describe the profiling infrastructure. Now I'll, hopefully I'll address these um, terms a bit more as we go. Um, but that's what, we're, that's what we're hoping to do. And as part of that, we've developed, if you like, a kind of process. Now, I just want I want to be quite clear, this is not an official FIRE process, it is not uh, an official interopen process. In fact, this is kind of me and a couple of other people sitting down and thinking, well, how would we, how would we get started? You know, how, how could we go from a, from a clinical problem of some sort to its, to its solution inside of FIRE? Um, and so here are the main steps. So, and this is really going to guide what we do today. We're going to start with a clinical problem. So we're going to define what it is that we're, we're trying to solve. We're going to develop an information model. And I'll talk about what that is, and then you guys, that'll be your first exercise, you will create an information model. We'll then move on and create a resources model, which is where we start to move it into fire. And the references graph is part of that. And then out of the end there come the actual real fire artifacts the value sets, the structure definitions, the concept maps, the, all the other geeky stuff that's needed underneath. And although it's very hard actually in, a, in, a, in, a, sli in a, a slide type thing, but you'll see at the top we've got clinician business analyst. That's supposed to be an arrow, by the way, pointing over to the right. And then down the bottom is another arrow pointing to the right, which is the fire expert. And as I say, unfortunately, it doesn't come through all that well here, but the, um, the clin clinician line is sort of dark at the beginning and it gets fainter at the end, whereas the fire expert is the other way around. And what that's trying to represent is the fact that I think that the clinical folk, the business experts, if you like, are heavily involved at the beginning of the process and then sort of less so as time goes on as we develop things. Whereas the fire experts, the terminologists, Less so in the beginning because they don't understand the domain, but more so as we go through. And so that, that's how the two groups, if you like, can kind of work together. And also how you, know, you can exchange knowledge as you go. So the uh, clin clinical business people can learn more about fire as they go through some of these exercises. The fire slash terminologists learn more about health as they go th through some of these exercises. So that's a, that's a kind of process that, we, um, that uh, we're sort of thinking about. But I was sitting in a pub in Shepherd's Bush on, on Sunday, and it was a really, really nice day, and I would got there on the subway. I love the subway. I suspect you guys have a love-hate for it, but, but to me it's kind of magic. You pop down a hole, go somewhere, you come up another. I'm from New Zealand, right? You know, for us, um, for us bicycles are exciting. But, um, so I sort of thought, well, this might be a... And, and in, the, you know, in, the, um, in the tube, you've got those, um, that beautiful graphic, uh, that famous graphic. And I sort of thought to myself, Maybe we could think about representing what we're trying to do using that sort of graphic. And this is my first, my first uh, cut at it. It's, uh, it, it's actually, do we have a, a laser pointer by any chance? Do, is anybody, can we? Is it, oh, would you mind? Sorry, I should have thought about that. Um, so this is really saying the same sort of thing as I had in the previous one, but it's starting out with a, with a clinical need at the top there, and then you move on to your requirements, and then you shuffle on to your information model, and then you exercise it in a resource graph, resource model. The flow on down there through extension definition station, past value sets um, junction, 
three profiles and out to your implementation guide out the other side. Now, I, I think it looks pretty. I don't know if it actually means anything just yet, but I think it's something that's worth working on because it's, it's useful, I think, to call out the parts as we go through. Um, we are going to be talking about this upper part today. Uh, as I say, we are going to be focusing mostly on fire for clinicians, not fire for techies. If we want to do a fire for techies event, we certainly can, but, but we don't have time to do that today. So we're going to be talking about this, this information resourcing area at the top there rather than the underlying artifacts. I will touch on these towards the end of the day. But um, I think as Amir pointed out, under the, you know, as you dig down, fire can become quite complicated. So we're going to start with the clinical problem. And at this point, I'm going to uh, pass across again to my lovely assistant. Uh, well, you did say that you yeah. were my lovely assistant. Yeah. Uh, assistant, yes, but. <laughs> I'm not that lovely. Yeah, I'm afraid not. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> well, so. not, to, not to me, anyway. <laughs> so the clinical problem. So we wanted to try and make this a bit real for what's happening in the UK. So um, transfer of care is a deliverable item in the standard contract. So what that means is a document which has content to be transferred from acute setting to GP setting, for example. And that may be a discharge summary. Now, there are other areas like um, uh, outpatient letters and mental health. But just think a document with content and discharge summaries from trust to GPs or from trust to other services would be the use case example. So that's in the standard contract for delivery. And remember, the uh, standard contract it puts the onus on the providers to deliver that. It doesn't then reach back down subsequently to the vendors. So the providers are responsible for this. So what does a transfer of care document look like? Well, it, it has these headings. So, so patient demographic, encounter problems. And these, these headings have been created through consensus through the professional record standards body that represents the clinicians in the UK to say that these are the kinds of content that um, we feel as clinicians should be in a document. And inside those, underneath those headings, are what I call further detailed content, which you can elaborate in a computable form by using details like NHS number, using terminology like SNOMED, and a derivative of SNOMED, DMND, which talks about medication, and also free text. Okay. So let's think of this as the use case example that we're going to build our FIRE models around to try and help you understand as clinicians how FIRE and its resources and its profiles may be used to transmit this clinical content that you and I need to look after patients and communicate with each other. That's the purpose of today. So the sending organisation needs to give it to a recipient and that we don't often talk about the patient, so I, I personally at the moment am striving for success in NHS Digital, my other role, I'm a, an interoperability clinical lead in NHS Digital, being that the patient always receives a copy of everything. So that's, that's my personal marker of success, okay? but it doesn't always happen. So this transfer of care document going from a sending organisation to a recipient, uh, and just diagrammatically goes through, people call it a tunnel and a pipe, <laughs> however you want to call it, and it has security controls and has information governance controls. But we're not really talking about that today. What we're talking about is packaging this clinical content in what I'm calling a technical art fire artifact, and you're going to learn about this today. Does that make sense? That's what we're here to learn about because we're quite closely aligned to here. We need to, as clinicians working with technical experts, we need to be able to communicate to them how they can use the technology to transmit that information, but also have an understanding so that when they come back and say, well, this is what I think it should look like, technically, we need to have an understanding to be able to verify that. And we haven't really developed that methodology yet, but I'm working with my colleagues Munish Jakani and the Interopen Space to try and find out how that methodology might evolve. And it does require increasing the education amongst clinicians to get you all involved so we can work together. So that's the remit of today. Think about e-discharge as a transfer of care document, the fire artifacts as a technology. How is that going to be used to carry that content? And that content has headings. And within those headings, there's content that may be used 
that may be represented in terminology like SNOMED or in free text? Interesting that you should use a discharge summary as a uh, use case for fire. And I can understand how you would construct such a document at the transmitting end. But one of the big problems that you have in clinical care now is that structured data such as you might have at the transmitting end is rendered into free text and then saved as a PDF or something on a, on a GP system. So it's no longer a live document, it's a snapshot. And there are two problems with that. One is the GDPR, which is coming in in April, requires data to be current, not a snapshot. And the, the second thing is that one of the components of that was a plan. Now, plan, I, plans, I think everyone should have a plan when they're transferring care between clinicians. But a plan has within it targets and timetables. And, and these are constructs which you can enter at the transmitting end, but you can't recode at the receiving end because the systems don't allow you to contain those types of parameters. Yeah. Are you going to cover yeah. that? Yes. <laughs> Just, the, one of the purposes of today is to help all of us understand this technology better. A higher order purpose for the interopen community is to be able to publish some standards so that sending people and receiving people can take this structured content and not necessarily turn it into the PDF snapshot but use the content in their systems. But we have to put the standards out there. So our role as clinicians is to support that process and validate it clinically. I'm Nick Booth, I'm a GP from um, Are you therefore prepared to say that the headings in your example represent the information more than that uh, We're going to come on to that. A it's a good question. It, it, this is about um, today's learning about what that yeah, means. Yeah, I mean, they're both really good questions because they are hopefully the sort of stuff that will kind of yeah. fiddle through. Because you're quite right. At the moment, if we're just passing text across, that's sort of better than nothing at all, but not a lot better than nothing at all. Yeah. Well, what we're trying to do is to put the structured data across. Yeah. So this was my picture. Um, it's, it's actually truly horrible, but when I was checking for some reason that cloud didn't uh, come up. So I, I did it, I, I mean, this is the same thing as Amir had. I, my, my slight difference is I had the discharge summary going up into some shared store rather than going directly from one person to another. But that's just an architectural style. You can do it in different ways. And the point I really kind of wanted to make, as Amir has done so, is that we're talking about the contents of that discharge summary. We're not talking about all the other bits are, that are around it, and there are plenty of options for that. Okay, uh, and yes, focusing on the document uh, document content, content only. So now I'm going to get into the uh, into what an inf what an information model is, which is the first step on our way. We've identified our our requirement, what we want to do. How do we start working towards it? So the information model, uh, it, I mean the word information model is one that's going to mean slightly different things to slightly different people and there are people that know a lot more about these things than I. But when I'm talking about this, this is the information that the clinician wants to share. It, it doesn't reflect how it's stored, it doesn't reflect how it's captured, it's just the way for a clinician to be able to sit down and say, right, to make any kind of sense, I need this and I need that and I need the other thing as well. So it's thinking about what, what I want to share with another person. It's a, technically it's a form of what we call a logical model. It doesn't actually depend on you know, how we actually store it. It's sort of, uh, it allows you to be open about it. And it's important to realize there are different ways to represent an information model. We're going to use fire because I'm a fire kind of guy, but open EHR is another, uh, is another commonly used, particularly in the UK, information model, uh, as is something called SIMI, um, common information model something I always forgot, is ISO 13.6 and 6 are others. So there are different ways you could represent the information. Uh, this is just one of them, but fundamentally they're the same. Fundamentally they're saying, here's the data I want to get from one person to another person. I need to start getting a little bit technical. Um, this is part of that part of that journey. Um, you need to understand the concept of a data type. Now we're going to talk about this 
a bit more as you go along. Uh, but there are some that's worth being aware of as you start down the information model journey. And a data type is, a, if you like, the, the basic unit upon which you make up resources. Again, we're going to talk about those shortly. The ones that I'd just like to draw your attention to is a, a string, which is just a sequence of characters. That's like text. A date, obviously, is just that, a date. A quantity is an amount of things. And finally, a codable concept. This is probably one of the most important data types that we have in FHIR. I'm going to talk a lot more about it as we go through. But that's where you put your coded data. So that's where you put your link to your terminology. So those are four kind of data types just to be aware of when you, when you get started. So now we're going to start talking about ClinFire. So ClinFire is an application. Uh, it's available on the web. It's free to use. Uh, it's browser-based. Uh, ClinFire.com. Is, uh, is where you can access to it. Uh, it's been in development for about two years. And we started this out in HL7 International because what was happening was that fire itself was starting to gain traction. It was about two and a half years or so ago. It was starting to gain traction, and the techies were on board. The techies got it. And the clinical folk were sort of struggling to get up to speed with it but they realized how important it was. Now, HL7 is comprised of quite a number of committees. The committees have a big clinical involvement. They're divided up into specialty areas, like patient care, like pharmacy, um, uh, and so forth. And so those folks wanted a way to be able to participate in this development. And we realized that expecting them to share JSON documents and XML documents and that kind of stuff, make RESTful queries, wasn't going to cut it. So we started developing a tool which let the ordinary folk understand what's going on and use that to feed back into the standard. And that's where ClinFire came from. It's evolving. That's a nice way of saying that it changes a lot. So what it looks like today may not be what it looks like next week. Hopefully, it's improved. Hopefully, it hasn't broken anywhere. Reasonably good at not doing that these days. Um, but most importantly, what ClinFire does is reflects back the needs of clinicians. And we listen very closely to what people are doing, what their needs are, and then try and adapt it to meet those needs. Here's a list of some of the functions. Uh, you can use view patient data with it. The logical modeler is a tool we're going to use quite a lot today, as is the scenario builder. I'll talk a bit more about those as we go along. And then these three down at the bottom, the value set explorer, the extension definition editor, probably won't have time to do stuff with them today, although I'll explain what they are. And the implementation guide viewer finally is something we'll look at the end of the day. So that's what ClinFire is, is about. Um, over there is the front page of ClinFire. And I think uh, one more thing I just want to talk about. ClinFire, it's, it's kind of like what an application could be. So what it does is it talks directly to, to Fire servers. For the, for the technically inclined, it's a, it's a single page application written in AngularJS. Um, but as we'll see in a moment, what you do is you point it at FHIR servers, at servers that support the FHIR interface. And we've divided them up into three kind of categories. And this division is very deliberate because this division sort of reflects the way that we might divide up cap capability when we're building an ecosystem. These are the types or some of the types of services that we might be providing. So the patient and the data, this is where we put the actual information. The profiles, or well, the conformance resources, that's where we put all the things like the, um, like the profiles, like the extension definitions, things like concept maps, and more, more, lots of techie, geeky stuff. But this is, this is where you know, that definitional stuff sits. And then finally, the terminology. And the terminology, again, these are all important. But I'm coming to realize just how important proper terminology is. But terminology is hard. Terminology is really hard. And one of the things that FHIR does is to define what we call operations, which are kind of like interfaces, which make it very simple for an application to call. And all the complexity is hidden behind in the terminology server. And so as we'll see as we go through, um, through the day, we'll see how ClinFire can use some of that. It's very easy to make the call. Somebody else does all the complicated stuff. So those are the three servers that ClinFire recognizes. So I'm now going to do a demo of how it works. Do pay attention. Uh, feel free to um, play along as you want to, because after this is where we're going to get you guys to start building your own models. So, yep. When I 
first started on this journey, there's a lot of terms. I'm seeing some people in the room. Some people are sort of nodding more, other people a little bit. Don't worry, because like you know, the clinicians in the room, you went to med school and you did the classes, some things just sink in a little bit later. You know, you just got to go with it. Things just take some time to sink in. So don't worry. And other people will also be in the same boat as you. Remember, this is a workshop to learn. Do put your hand up if you're feeling stuck. And, and if I go too fast, do pull me back. Um, the problem when you're deep in this stuff is you forget what it was like when you started. Um, and, and dare I say it, Amir, our interactions have been really, really good because the stuff that I think is just so obvious when we talk about it. So, yeah. Don't I ask the really silly questions. Uh, and David then goes, oh, yeah, I, di I didn't think of it in that, yeah, way. that and way. You'll need to do that to help all of us. Yeah. So that's the URL for it um, at there, at clinfire.com. Um, so I'm just, hopefully this is going to work for me. It is. Okay. So now, hold on a second. I just need to get my bearings here. I'm going to go to there. Those other tabs. Okay. Now, can you guys see this at the back of the room? Yeah, you probably won't be able to see the details um, if you get really stuck at it. You know, <laughs> apparently they're up on the screens, top in there if you want to. So this is this is what you see. Now, the first thing to do is to set the servers over here. If you've gone in this for the first time today, it'll almost certainly be set because it defaults to the Happy Three server. If you need to change it, you can change it by clicking the Edit button like so. But as I say, most of the time it should be right to start out with. Do you want to get people to do it while you're doing it? I'll kind of run through it, I think. Um, as I say, do feel free to, uh, to to tag along as you do it, and we'll have a session straight after this one. We'll go into the uh, into the actual workshop. Um, here are the are the modules down this side here. So the patient viewer allows you to look at the data on an existing patient server. Server query lets you make queries. Scenario builder is where. Um, you actually link resources together to tell a clinical story. We'll be talking about this as we go. The logical modeler is the one we're going to focus on for now. I'll come back to that one in a second. Um, Im implementation guide viewer, extension definition builder, code system and value set. So there's a few things in there, but I'm going to go into the logical modeler. Okay, so to... It's actually quite pale, so hopefully it's going to work out. So to create a, so this is, um, this is what an information model looks like. So here's one that we created earlier. In fact, no, sorry, all I'll do is I'll start with, I'll create a new one. So to create a model, you click on the new model link like so. You give it a name. Now the name has to be unique on the server. So make it something which is unique to you. So for example, like DH, um, oops, DH minus my model and then click the check button and provided that's unique then you will get a little save button appears at the top there. That tells you that your model is okay. Uh, you're limited by some of the um, uh, characters. You can't put an underscore in there for example so it'll warn you about that. Otherwise you do that and then you get this blank thing that says my model. And what you're now going to start doing is you're now going to start adding elements to your model. So we're talking about a discharge summary. So the first thing we're going to want for a discharge summary is probably a patient. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click over here on this button that says Add Element. And I'll click on that. And then we get this dialog box. Yes, that comes up all right. Uh, and these are the, 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 the parts we can enter about this particular element. So we're going to give it a name over there. That's where the data type fits in. As we go on, you become more and more familiar with different data types. For now, feel free to just leave it at string. Remember, it doesn't really matter. All we're wanting to do is make a note down about what our information would be. This is the alternative to a spreadsheet or a piece of paper or a Word document. But we're doing it in a more structured format, which means we can do more interesting things with it. Uh, can I just mention, and it's also online, you see. So in the past, yeah. we'd have spreadsheets flying around between people. But one of the benefits is you can create this online, you can share it with people, you can get them to log, it, log in, and you can have a single place to do this kind of stuff together in a community, rather than emailing spreadsheets around. It's one of the other benefits. Yep, okay. So I'm going to 
say that I want to add a patient like so. There's lots of other stuff I can do but I'm going to leave it for right now. Um, just pay to put a description. Uh, this is called a tautological description which defines itself in terms of itself. You shouldn't do that but uh, I'm amongst friends and then you save and so now we have added this thing called a patient to our model. And so I'm then going to say well, what is it about a patient I want to I want to record? Well for a start I'm probably going to want their date of birth. And this time I can get a bit smarter. I can say well actually I happen to know that this is going to be a date. So I can set that. Uh, I can say it's their um, date of birth and so forth. And then I save that. And you just carry on doing that. So I might want to add their name. Oops. And then I'm going to think, well, okay, well, that's my demographics that's, that's done through here. I'm going to go back up here and I can start thinking about the other discharge summary stuff I want to record. So I want to record why they came into hospital. Okay. So I'm going to add a new element and I'm going to say this is going to be about the, um, the hospital stay. No spaces, by the way. Uh, I'll leave that alone. And then I'm probably going to want to say, well, when did they come into hospital? So I'm going to add a new element, and that's going to be the admit date. Uh, I know it's a date, so I might as well do it. The, the kind of the thinking here is that, you know, when you're brand new to it, you don't really kind of know what the data type, so it doesn't matter. But as you get more familiar with it, you can start getting smarter with some of these things. Um, and I'll add that, and so on and so forth. Uh, I want to, I might want to come up here, and I might want to add an element, which has got the uh, medications. and so forth, uh, meds on admission. Periodically, you want to save your model, like so, and it updates it. Up until that point, until you click save, it exists only on your, uh, your browser. When the power goes off, so does the model. As Amir says, this has now been shared, it's available online. Uh, you could actually go in on your browsers and you would find dh underscore my model and it would be there. I'll draw your attention to the fact we're using a test server. This test server actually is hosted in Canada, which is why it's taking a bit of time to get forward and backwards. The electrons take a bit of time when you go over the Atlantic. Um, the, uh, there's no, there's, there's, there is no security whatsoever around this. None whatsoever. Do not please ever put any personal information on these because anyone can see it. Secondly, don't really use it for anything which is mission critical because as I say because it's open somebody could go in and take my model and change it. So we're going to look at enhancing this as time goes on but as I say it's grown up as a training tool we haven't felt the need to for so far. That's about all. I might show you a couple of other things. So I, I talked about the fact that uh, this is the next step on from doing it in a Word document and the reason is because because it's being stored in a model, we can do other stuff. For example, we could generate a mind map uh, of, the, of the data. And it's generated from the designer information. If I add a new thing on here, like uh, allergies, like so, and my mind map will be updated down through there. I can view it in the format of a table if I don't want to view it in that tree. Um, I can look at the elements which are coded, of which there are none at the moment, uh, and there's a few other bits and pieces that we can, we can do as well.